I see what you did there. Which anybody could do because we're in a circle. We're missing him. Yeah. How did it, guys? Hello, 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 hello. Matthias. Yeah, the other guys are still in there. Matthias. <coughs> Matthias. Not said by me, huh? Well, uh, no, it's a camera. It's a camera. <laughs> that thing. The mic. <laughs> that thing. Yeah, that's speaker. the word. Because <laughs> it's recorded for forever on Facebook and YouTube. Well, somebody doesn't get on Facebook anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's got a mic right there. He doesn't approve of circles. This game is funny. <laughs> All right. Everybody ready? Okay. I figured since we had to clear everything out for the the clothing drive this weekend, we might as well sit in a circle. And I think it'll, maybe it'll help discussion. Maybe it won't. I think we normally get pretty good discussion anyway. But if nothing else, we've got mics strategically placed. And Phil, who worked out this morning, won't have to get up and run around. So um, we'll continue a little bit of the thought. We've been going down the last two weeks, or that's where we'll start. And, uh, and we'll talk about three different characters that we see in the New Testament. Um, has anybody here seen the TV show, Scooby-Doo? <laughs> yes is fine. <laughs> Who is typically the villain? What's, like, the villain in Scooby-Doo least expected. He's a normal person, right? He's almost always somebody you see in the first five minutes of the show, 
It's always a little bit disgruntled, and then he shows up later. Or um, something that it reminded me of was, I don't know if anybody else, to go back a little farther, well, less far, but not as frequent, the TV show MASH. Is anybody familiar with MASH? So there are a, a whole crew of supporting actors that would show up in different roles. It was always the same actor, but it may or may not be the same character that shows up, but it's the same actor. And what you see in the New Testament is the story that's told. There are a few characters that have recurring parts, even though you may not think of it right away. They're almost background actors. Um, but if you look a little deeper at their stories, I think there's interesting things to happen there. Um, it's the, the background actor that sometimes steals the show. So we'll start where we were last week with the crucifixion. Can someone go to Mark 15, 21? Any volunteers to read? Perfect. He's got a microphone. <laughs> a certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander, and Rufus was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. You can go ahead and read through 24. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. When they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not, then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. So here you see the introduction to a man, um, Simon of Cyrene. Uh, the father, father of Alexander and Rufus. So Mark does something interesting here. Um, he names specifically who, who carried the cross, as we talked about last week, the cross piece, the cross member for the cross. Um, he would have been one of 100,000 or so Jews from the area that's now in eastern Libya. That's where Cyrene was. Um, at about 200 BC, they were carried away and forced to live there, and there was a, actually a surprisingly large Jewish presence. So it's not necessarily uncommon for someone to have been leaving Jerusalem, a Cyrene, to head back that way. In this case, though, he was caught up in something. Now, it doesn't say in, in Mark here, and it doesn't say elsewhere, whether or not he was a disciple. It doesn't say um, if he was a follower of Christ. You don't see him specifically show up in Acts. But if we can have someone go to Romans 16, 13. Rufus chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Yeah, that was it. So Rufus mentioned again in Romans. You see a couple times in Acts. You'll see it in Acts 11, verse 20, if you wanted to mark that down. To go back and look at it, it mentions the Cyrene, or people from um, Cyrene's going and discussing Christ and teaching, which, based on what you read in Romans, leads you to believe that Rufus was likely one of those. So there's a clue in verse 21 that kind of stands out to say, hey, this person may show up later in the story. You haven't seen them before. In, in Mark 15, verse 21, and can someone identify what the clue might be? He was the father 
and then it gave two names. And you may or may not see both of those names again, but if they're specific enough to name that they were brothers to someone, that he was father to sons, or those type things, names were very important to identify someone in, in the New Testament. It often was a clue that they would show up again, or that they had some significant place. And I'm not saying that they were Scooby-Doo villains, but that same type of detective work and watching out for who you see mentioned shows up again in other places in the scripture. And, and then a little later on, if someone can go to John, um, let's see, I didn't put the verse in it. Sorry, bear with me. Okay. Uh, if someone can read Mark 15, verse 42 through 46. Mark, Mark 15, 42 through 46. Jake, since you've got the mic, do you want to read it? It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. As, so as evening, evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, the, prom, the prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead, summoning the centurion he asked him if Jesus had already died when he learned from the centurion that it was so he gave the body to Joseph so Joseph saw, bought some linen cloth took down the body wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of a rock then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb thank you so this goes along with what you read in John 19, verse 38 and 39. The difference in John's version is he mentioned that Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. And in verse 39, it says, he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds of spices. So the two men here, it goes through detail to lay out who this new character is, Joseph of Arimathea, to say that, that he was important, that the place where Jesus was going to be buried, the tomb that he owned, was a prominent man's tomb, a, a rich man's tomb. But then in John, he takes the additional time to mention Nicodemus, to say not only did Jesus have a proper tomb, but Jesus was buried with a prince's amount of spices. You, you could bury a hundred people with the, the amount of spices that, that Dick, Nicodemus provided for Jesus. Can someone read John 3, verse 1 through 15? John 3, 1 through 15. Jewish ruling council he came to Jesus at night and said Rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you are going you are doing if God were not with him Jesus replied very truly I tell you no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again how can someone be born when they are old Nicodemus asked surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. 
You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. There's a lot going on in this first part of John. So for a character who's introduced once and then gets a brief mention later in the story, he had a pretty long conversation with Jesus that Jesus lays out nearly the entire theology of what he's about to do. And Nicodemus, while he was interested, wasn't necessarily ready. So he's a Pharisee. He, he believes that the spirit's going to be, or the soul's going to be resurrected. Um, he believes in the prophets and the old law, um, but they're very regimented about what that looks like. Um, tithing the spices and forgetting the, the more important, the weightier matters of the law. Um, and the weightier matters of the law in heart. And so he, he comes and he presents a, a fairly reasonable question. He, he does it in the traditional rabbinic way. He would come up and he, he compliments the teacher first and says, look, you, this, all the things you're doing, I acknowledge what you're doing, comes from God. And no one could do this if it wasn't for God. And Jesus goes, great, let's jump into the deep water. And he immediately goes, all right, you have to be born again. I know where you're going. That's what you need. And Nicodemus, a Pharisee, also knows the rules and how to ask these questions. And so he, you, they would ask questions in a way that would narrow down or rule out obvious answers and allow the teacher to, to teach and reveal something profound. And so he says, okay, you, you obviously can't mean being born again when we're old. Are you talking about he, he's kind of hinting to, are you talking about the resurrection? And then, surely you can't enter a second time into your mother's womb, so this can't be a fleshly thing. Are you saying now, are you going to reveal that the body isn't raised again? It's kind of up in the air for the Pharisees. It's something they wouldn't know. And Jesus says, okay, we can go down this road, and he, he lays it out. You have to be born again. Um, he talks some about the spirit, and this is the point when Nicodemus is now completely underwater and lost. And goes, I, I, don't, I don't get it. How can this be? And he just, he asks a straightforward question. I'm lost. Uh, you, you took a leap that I wasn't ready for. And then Jesus steps back and he goes, okay. You, you need to be a little humble here. You were following all the rigorous rules of how you talk to a teacher. You were very proper in it. Um, even though you came at night, you, you acted like you thought you should have. And so Jesus hits him with some fairly deep stuff. He would have understood the, understood the reference here the Son of Man, which is in Daniel, and would have known that Daniel was talking about the Messiah. Um, and the reference between Daniel and Moses would have been completely new, but it wouldn't have been lost on Nicodemus. And so have you ever shown up in a class and thought, there was something I missed last year because the teacher just went off on a topic that I am not prepared for? Anybody take a, like a geometry class and the first thing they start talking about are different equations and you're going, I'm, I passed algebra, but <laughs> what? Tri <laughs> triangles, I've seen them, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so that's what happens here. And he shows up again in John 7:50. So here's another recurring character, and he, he's admonishing the Sanhedrin that, look, you need to follow the law, and you need to give these people a chance before jumping to judgment. And then he shows up again at the burial. And Jesus had such a significant impact in what is essentially a 15-minute conversation that he brings, you know, 100 funerals worth of burial spices 
And for both Joseph and Nicodemus, one from the ruling council and a leading Pharisee, preparing a dead body close to, uh, close to the Sabbath would have been very risky. Like you don't have a lot of time, You've, you're expected to do it right because people are gonna look at how you prepared the body. But at the same time, once the sun sets, you've turned into a pumpkin and you can't go anywhere now. You've, you've now committed to a very local region of how far you can travel, what work you can do. And so they took something on that was, at the time, would have been very risky. And it was under the supervision, if you, watch, if you read a little farther on, of, of the ladies who had followed Jesus around Mary. So these, these recurring characters made me think of, of someone a little different. Um, and in this case, we never get this other character's name, regardless of how important this person was. So where did we meet Peter in the scripture? Where's the first time we see Peter? Fishing? Right, so it's, it's a little earlier than that when James and John bring Jesus to Peter's house, Peter and Andrew's house. So we're a little short on time, so I'm going to skip one verse. Can someone go to Mark 1, 29 through 34? Something happens with Peter before Jesus even asked to get in the boat that had such a significant impact on Peter that he was willing to essentially work a double shift after immediately working the night shift. He'd been fishing all night and Jesus comes up to the boats and asks to go back out, tells Peter to, to essentially do his whole work again and then he's gonna have to clean it again. He's asking Peter to do a double shift. Peter goes, I know what I'm doing, but I trust you. So can someone read Mark 1, 29 through 34? So who are, the, who are the characters in this part of the story? We've got Jesus, and then who else? James and John. Simon, Peter, and Andrew. Mother-in-law. And then eventually the whole town. There's one more person that's mentioned, but only by reference if you read verse 30. So it, it doesn't mention her directly, but Peter must have had a wife. And for her to have, have been involved would have been expected. And you would have expected actually Peter's wife to have been caring for the mother-in-law. And when they ask, when they say they, you, you don't know, they deliberate, he deliberately leaves it blank on who the they is that's asking Jesus to help. What was the mother-in-law's response after being healed? She began to wait on him. And she was so stricken by it. Oh, now he's, he's in our house and I... I'm saved and it's not, I, I need to work is what she turned into. I don't think that's an unreasonable response. You see that several times in scripture. But Peter having a wife was something that I, I didn't consider very much reading through the New Testament, reading through the letters Peter wrote until relatively recently. It's important, it's important enough that they mentioned 
mother-in-law instead of just saying her name and referencing who she was. But we don't hear a lot about Peter's wife. Can someone go to 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 6? Corinthians 9, 3 through 6? Yes. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat the, its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk Thank you. of the flock? Do you say these things That's right. as a mere man? That's good. <laughs> oh, three through six, I'm sorry. You're all right. I always sorry hesitate to hey, interrupt going. somebody reading the scripture. Um, you never know who needed to hear that next part. So in, in verse five, Cephas there, in, in the notes it says, which is Peter, is referencing Peter as one of the other apostles that took along a believing wife. So you see in 1 Corinthians, the next time you, you hear mention of Peter's wife is much later, and it's a letter from Paul to one of the other churches. So it's something that I, don't, I didn't consider when I read the, the book of Acts and talked about the travels of Peter and all the work he was doing. It didn't occur to me, though it seems foolish that it didn't, that Peter's wife would not have been a, a very critical part of it of what he was doing. And knowing that Peter took his wife along, and it mentions deliberately that it's a believing wife, it makes me read 1 Peter verses 3, 1 through 7 with completely different eyes, knowing that this isn't Paul writing on the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the understanding of Scripture. This is Peter who has an example, a companion with him that he's writing about. So this will be the last one we read. Can someone read? First um, Peter three, verses one through seven. So knowing that Peter is writing with his wife likely right beside him throughout all of this makes me see this in a little different light. In chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he's talking about the sacrifices Christ makes, the heart of Christ to take a submissive role up to the point of even crucifixion. And then he starts in verse 1 comparing wives not to the church like Paul normally does, he compared wives in the same way. In other words, have the same heart as what I was just talking about. Have the same heart of Christ 
and then submit yourselves to your husbands. Just like Christ submitted to an unbelieving world in this way, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands so that if they don't believe, they may be won over without words by the behavior of your wives. And then he talks about the beauty of, of a Christian wife. And I can't help but think that he's ta- thinking of his own wife's, his own, his own yeah, I, I can't get the plural right on that if I was to try. Um, beauty when he's talking about this. And what are the things, the beautiful aspects that he mentions a Christian wife would have? Gentle, a quiet spirit in herself, reverence, purity, not vain. You picture this fisherman's wife as being someone who at some point probably helped mend nets and fishermen's clothes, and then later the, the robes of the fishers of men that was companion alongside. He compares Christian wives to Sarah and then said that they're going to be daughters of Sarah and Abraham if they act that way. <laughs> right. I, I, yeah, I was very tempted to title the lesson Married to a Rock. <laughs> right? I, can't, I mean, think of the way he, he confronts Christ on things that obviously in the role of the Messiah, and he has no problem going up and being like, yeah, I know what you're doing, but you're doing it wrong. Right? And you can imagine that she's working on something at the house, and he does the same. He comes up and, I appreciate what you're doing, but... That's not it. And she had to have patience because he was so quick right. to respond to things. He just jumps right out there whether he knows for sure what he's about to do or not. So it's something that, that looking at... Looking at those verses for a day's context, uh, I read them all Thank you. <laughs> so it, it identified, so taking the time to look at some of these secondary characters can then add more color and understanding um, to even something later, much later in the epistles or in the other letters, and give a little deeper meaning to um, when he talks about being quiet spirit and gracious. I. I can't imagine taking a trip with somebody who didn't want to go, um, or taking a trip when your wife is at home and upset about it, but even more so taking her along with you, like it mentions they do in First Corinthians, if she wasn't completely on board. And uh, <laughs> so it's taking time to go back and do that, and then, um, as he mentioned here, to have the spirit of Christ. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for, for letting us come together to fellowship and, and study your word. Help us to, to gain a little deeper understanding of, of the scripture and, and those that walked the path before us. Dear Lord, help us to walk in a way that would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.